Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so thanks very much for joining us for um, today's um, second ice sheet session. So today we'll be focusing um, very much on Antarctica and we've got a really um, great range of speakers lined up. Um, so my name's Mal McMillan, for those of you that don't know me, I'm from Lancaster University and the UK Centre for uh, Polar Observation and Modelling. Um, and I'll be co-hosting um, this session um, along with Angelica Humbert from RV. Um, so um, we've got roughly uh, 20 minutes for each talk. Um, unfortunately, our second talk, um, Johan Nielsen, um, has withdrawn. So um, please think of lots of great questions for John, because we'll have a, a 20 minute question and answer slot. Um, but no, more seriously, we'll stick with the original schedule in case people are joining for specific talks. Um, so we may have um, a shortish break after the first talk before then coming back. Um, for Anna's at 9.40, so a chance for those of you that need a, a cup of tea or something to go and get one. Um, if you have questions, please um, post them in the chat during the talk. It would be great to have some questions for the speakers and some discussions at the end, because I think there's a lot of um, really interesting science that we're going to hear about. Um, and finally, just a reminder that we have our poster session um, this evening at, at 5.40 CEST. And again, um, if you take a look through, there's some really interesting posters there which cover both um, novel methods for cryosat, but also a range of um, other satellite sensors as well as people are increasingly looking to combine um, across different sensors. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to John for our for our first talk. So uh, John Bamber from uh, Bristol University, and he's going to be talking about um, complex and evolving patterns of mass loss uh, from Antarctic's largest glacier. Uh, floor's yours, John. John. Um, all look good. Yeah, we can hear you. We can see you. It looks great. Thanks. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, well, thanks for joining everyone. Um, I am going to report on um, a piece of work that we did um, at University of Bristol um, and published actually last year as part of a larger project to map the grounding line of Antarctica using CRISAT data. Um, and I just acknowledge my co-author here, Geoffrey Dawson, who's also at University of Bristol, um, currently working on um, sea ice thickness with uh, CRISAT, and he did most of the CRISAT uh, swath processing for this project. Uh, so. Uh, Antarctica's largest glacier, by that I mean largest um, in terms of discharge, and that's um, Pine Island Glacier. And I suspect that everybody um, joining this morning know, knows uh, plenty about Pine Island and where it is and what it's been doing in the past. But I thought I'd just uh, kind of introduce uh, a few key points about it. So this this plot on the left is um, actually elevation change um, over the whole of Antarctica for about a seven and a half year period from CRISAT data. CRISAT um, POCA, that's um, uh, non-SWATH data, um, is the sort of standard in the commons data set um, that people have been using. And you can see that there's some um, extensive thinning over Pine Island and actually over other areas in uh, the Amundsen Sea and Bayman in Antarctica. Um, um, and that uh, is not particularly big news. In fact, that the, the plot on the right here, which um, is from a really nice paper by Ian Jockin in 2003. Um, it's a little bit complex to um, unravel and, and see what's going on. But the, the key message and the reason for showing this is that um, what this shows is that there was a speed up um, of Pan Island Glacier in the, sometime in the 1990s, and that it's it's been losing mass since then. And so that's a, about 30 years that um, uh, we've, we've seen the acceleration and mass loss of Pan Island Glacier. Um, actually, in the 2000s, it slowed. The rate of mass loss um, reduced slightly, um, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that in the current in subsequent slides. But some of you may have seen that Ian um, published a, an, an update on um, this analysis. Actually, just on Friday, um, 11th of June, it was in um, Science Advances, um, and this is one of the headline figures from it. It's a really nice um, study. And as I said, there was a, um, not exactly a, a hiatus in mass loss, but the the rate of acceleration decreased and actually um, mass loss, the rate of mass loss went down um, slightly during the 2000s. But what Ian found 
in this re most recent study was that um, sometime around 2017 or so, um, a large part of the um, floating ice shelf, just section just here actually, uh, broke away and um, it's reduced the buttressing and there was a speed up um, between 2017 and 2020, about 10 to 15 percent um, in ice motion. And what we what we looked at in our study was um, actually the impact of um, thinning rates of the floating ice shelf rather than um, uh, major carving events. And, and so I'm not going to say so much about that, but that's an important sort of caveat to some of the some of the conclusions we reach about um, the impact of enhanced thinning of the um, ice shelf on flow and mass loss. Um, I, I quite like this. It's just a sort of bit of background, really. I quite like this figure, which shows um, approximately the number of papers that were published on Pine Island glaciers as a function of time. And, and, and the reason I show this is that actually, if you take the integral, you can see there's massive jump in um, papers published on, on the glacier around 2010. And it's continued at a rate of somewhere between 40 and 50 papers. So this is one of the most studied glaciers on the planet now. If you take the integral of that, curve it's getting on for something like a thousand papers and so um we um in in our study of um grounding lines um uh, across antarctic we weren't really expecting to sort of see anything particularly interesting that hadn't already been reported um and this plot on the right um is uh well it shows um the grounding lines of various different sectors around um, Antarctica. But actually, the, the reason for showing this um, is um, it indicates the um, the number of observations per unit area, um, per square kilometre, in fact, um, between different modes that were available to us for this study looking at um, grounding lines. And I think um, others have already um, emphasised the fact that if, if we incorporate SWOTH data, we increase the number of observations by about 200. Now, SWOTH data are a little bit noisier, but they're not, um, if you take the RMS or um, yeah, the RMS and that, they're, they're not 15 times noisier. So actually you get improved coverage and slightly improved accuracy um, using SWOTH data. And this um, plot on the bottom left actually shows the coverage we obtained by taking all the across that data available to us, both SWOTH and POCA point of closest approach data. Um, and you can see in areas of complex topography like the Aronson Sea embayment, um, we are very reliant on SWOTH mode data to give us the kind of coverage and, and density of observations that, that we wanted for this particular study, which was um, mapping grounding line characteristics and migration over time. Actually, uh, this plot shows, um, makes that point in a little bit more detail. Again, the, on the top here, we have the density of observations um, per, per unit area per square kilometre. Um, and uh, this is for SWOTH data, and on the right is for POCA. Um, and you can see, um, you know, there are, the, the scale, the scale is different by a factor of 100. Really important to notice here. So this is, as many as 2,000 observations per square kilometre uh, and a maximum of 20 um, using POCA data. And you can see um, there are parts of the, the black dashed line here is the grounding line, 2,000 of grounding line on Pine Island Glacier. These um, contours are velocity contours, just so you know what you're looking at. Um, and you can see that there are places where the density of coverage using POCA data is actually very low, um, you know, close to sort of zero per square kilometre. Um, and uh, the bottom panel shows the, the, the difference in um, spatial resolution that you obtain using SWOTH and POCA data for, for the um, frontal area, the downstream area of Pan Island Glacier here. Um, this is um, SWOTH data and POCA on the right. And you can, you know, you can, you can see that there, there is some thinning. I apologize for the color table here. I, I know it's not the best for those that are colorblind, um, but it kind of emphasizes um, the range of um, uh, thinning rates that we see over an island glacier at the front for, I think this is for um, a, 
average of 2015 to 2018. I'm going to show this this again, but you can see that there's a lot more detail um, um, in this um, bottom left plot, um, and in particular, what 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 I'm going to focus on quite a bit um, in subsequent slides is that um, the maximum thinning rate, which um, reaches about three meters a year, so that was that was less than the, the maximum that we've seen over the the glass area over time. Um, is actually um, located in an area of um, relatively slow flow. So the velocity contour, you may not be able to see it, is 100 meters here. And, and the, the, the other one to the left of it uh, that I'm just outlining is 25 meters here. So this is a slow flow area. It's not in the fast flowing trunk of um, the outlet glacier. And actually, um, the thinning rates are about three times lower in the fast flowing main trunk of Palayan Glacier. And that was a bit of a surprise to us. We really weren't expecting to see that. Um, this is this is just a um, six year period um, from 2012 to 2017, showing how um, using swath mode um, processing, um, showing how the pattern of thinning over the glacier is evolving in time. And, and uh, I'll show an animation of this in a minute, but you, you can hopefully see um, that there are some quite significant changes in where thinning and by thinning also equals mass loss. So, so you know, maximum mass loss is taking place in these red areas, actually at the margins of fast flow here, um, but has has reduced quite significantly in 2017. And um, it, the the pattern of thinning is evolving actually very rapidly, far far faster than we expected. Um, so this this is now um, slightly sort of more detailed picture of um, two time periods, 2010 to 14 and 15 to 18. And it shows the difference in the pattern of thinning and therefore the pattern of mass loss over Pine Island Glacier um, between these two periods. And it's markedly different, particularly the area of maximum mass loss straight thinning um, on the um, western edge of um, Pine Island Glacier here. Um, the other thing I want to point out about this plot, and I will show this one again, on the left, we have the velocity contours in red. So this one is a thousand meters. This one here running through the middle of the area of fast flow of, of maximum thinning is 100 and this is 25. On, on the right, um, these contours are plotting something different. This is the elevation um, below flotation. So in other words, um, this, this line here that um, has a value of 500, the, the, the one that goes furthest inland, that, that is the amount of thinning required um, to uh, reach flotation. In other words, um, the, the limit where the grounding line will be located um, for that amount of thinning. So if we have 500 meters of thinning um, over the um, outlet glacier, the new grounding line will lie here, and we have a 250 meters here and 100 here. And the white line here is the current grounding line. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we um, it's it's not a surprise that uh, we're finding mass loss in Pamela and Glass. Uh, it's 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 been losing mass for the best part of 30 years, um, and this. Nice study by um, Conrad et al. Um, shows um, thinning from um, satellite altimetry, um, some of it, I think, using cryosat data um, for the early 2000s and then the later period. And you can see that there is um, higher thinning during the early part of the 2000s from about 05 to 010. And the rate is up to about six to seven or the maximum value reaches about six to seven meters of thinning. And by 2010 to 2015, um, that has, has significantly reduced. The mass loss from the, the glacier has gone down a little um, and the, the pattern has changed. So, so you can see the maximum thinning is starting to migrate to the edges of fast flow um, in that plot. Um, and so we we tried to investigate or we we looked at the various factors that might be influencing the pattern of thinning. And this is um, a plot of uh, thinning rates over the floating ice shelf buttressing Pine Island Glacier. 
And you can see that from about um, 1998 to 2010, there's relatively uniform thinning of the floating shelf. Um, but then there's a, a hiatus, which has been reported elsewhere by um, Dutroux and, and Pierre Dutroux and others, um, between about 2010 and 2013. And we see that um, the rate of thinning um, of the inland ice, the ground ice, um, decreases during that time. That's when we get this, this um, sort of deceleration of mass loss. But then it accelerates again in 2013 to about the rates that we see in the early part of the period. But we didn't see a coincident increase, not yet at least, increase in um, thinning near the, um, near the carbon front. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I will skip. I've, I've shown that before. Um, so we looked at what what factors might be potentially influencing the complex pattern of evolving thinning and therefore mass loss um, near the um, rounding line of Pine Island Glacier. So the black line here is the 2011 grounding line, and there are some others in white plotted on this this figure here. These tracks are ISAT, ISAT 1 tracks from um, showing thinning rates from the early 2000s, well, early to mid 2000s, similar to that shown by Conrad and others. You can see that you, you do have, um, this is saturated here, I think the thinning rates do reach about five meters a year. And you can see that they're a maximum in the area of fastest flow and close to the grounding line. Um, and um, on the left, we've got um, a profile, a cross profile from this ISAC track here, shown in black, um, showing the changes in elevation, um, velocity, um, well, both across track and long track velocity, and elevation rate across that transect. Um, and we also plotted these triangles show changes in driving stress due to the evolving um, surface, well, the changes in surface slope as the um, glacier thins. And um, you, you may not be able to see, but the maximum um, rates of change in driving stress were about three kilopascals, so quite small, uh, potentially too small to really influence the, the um, changes in um, thinning rates that we, we've seen in the data. Um, and you know we we so we wanted to ask the question you know what does this mean for the stability and future of um future mass loss of the uh, glacier and uh, this is not modeling study we simply use geometric constraints to um assess um on geometric grounds what the grounding line migration rates could be for different thinning rates and that's what this top plot here shows so this this dashed line here is um, sh shows the location um, of the flotation point, which is 250 meters um, above the current current um, flotation point. Didn't explain that very clearly, but you need 250 meters of thinning for the grounding line to reach this point here, and 500 to reach this here. And with the current rates of thinning that we have close to the grounding line of about a meter a year. Um, and, and we're not saying that, that, they, that they are not going to accelerate. Clearly, that would take 250 years to um, for the grounding line to migrate from um, point two here to this, this point here, which is about 50 kilometers in land. Um, yeah, actually, so just, just on this, I think, how am I doing for time? Um, am I slightly, I uh, probably sort of close, close to the end. I'm running into you've got about you've got about three minutes, John. Okay, I'm running into you can, you can have slightly longer if you want. What's that? You can have slightly longer if you want, given that well, our next that, topic. That, that is what I was thinking. Uh, a bit cheeky, but I, I, um, um, yeah. So um, even even if the rates um, reach the sort of values we saw in the earlier time period around 2004, which were five meters a year, um, it would take 50 years for the grounding line to migrate from this black dashed line here to this point here. So that's that's the kind of argument we were using um, there. One other really interesting aspect of this is that um, 
uh, it's, it's sort of a bit of a side note, but it's, it's quite an important point to make is that um, uh, a number of studies have used um, GPS data in Antarctica to investigate the um, viscous, uh, the rheological properties of the mantle in West Antarctica. And this star shows the location of an important uh, GPS, um, sort of semi-permanent GPS station um, close to the mouth of Pine Island Glacier that's been used to infer rheological properties of the mantle. Um, but to do that, you need to correct for um, elastic uplift. And um, the, the elastic uplift is a function of um, uh, surface mass loss, the pattern of DHDT. And you can see that it's changing very significantly close to this um, GPS site here. And this will influence your elastic correction very significantly because the folding distance is of, of the order of 40 to 50 kilometers for uh, elastic uplift rates. And so um, if you do want to use GPS data in Antarctica uh, for that kind of analysis, you have to be very, you, you really do have to be concerned about the detailed pattern of thinning um, close to the, the site. So I have sort of run out of time, so I'll just go straight to um, my conclusions, um, which are those. Great. Well, you were, no, you were spot on time. So thank you very much for that, Jonathan. So um, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, so we can we now have time for for questions if anyone has them. Uh, I think Angelica, you've been monitoring the chat. Yeah, there is a question from Paolo um, who's asking, where does the two year signal come from in the publication records? Where does the two year signal? Yeah. I'm not sure I understand the question. I. Um, so you showed that graph in. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. In uh, about the publication. Yeah. Why, why does it jump up uh, in 2010? Mm -hmm. Is that the question? I, I uh, think I think so. Uh, Paolo, Paolo, do you want to ask? <laughs> I think he means was there a two a two um a wa an oscillation with a um, oh. wavelength of two years? I think that's what he was relating to. <laughs> oh, I see. Right. Yeah. No idea. Yeah. Uh, interesting problem. I we'll look into it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I would have yeah. a question myself, Jonathan. Um, you showed so impressively the very little change in the basal uh, shear stress or the basal drag. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, the basal drag is uh, relatively insensitive to uh, changes in signals because the basal velocity is uh, capable of changing so much and so quickly. It can respond very fast. It, um, Angelica, it wasn't basal drag we plotted there. It was um, dry driving stress, the gravitational driving stress. Ah, okay, good, yeah. thank you. And and that, that uh, you know, we wanted to understand what was driving the complex, you know, this this unusual or unexpected pattern of thinning over the glacier. And so we looked at, could it be the fact that the surface slopes are changing at mm -hmm. the margins of the glacier? And I mean, you know, that, that seems the most obvious explanation, but the changes in driving stress are quite subtle. And so, so we think we we don't know, but we think it 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 it, it must be partly due to, um, you know, changes in surface slope at, at the edges of the the fast flowing trunk, but also possibly a change in basal traction as well over mm -hmm. that time period. But that's conjecture. Thank you. I can currently see no other question in the chat, so please, all participants, if you are interested in asking a question to Jonathan, just put it in the chat. Yeah, so I can ask one while we're waiting. So, so what's the next steps for this work, John? Are you planning to apply a similar approach to other glaciers or bring in other sensors to the same glacier? Um, well, yes to the first. Um, I mean, I think it'd be really interesting to to um, analyze the swaths. And, and I know that Noel now has pretty much processed all of the data um, and it's kind of available to anyone who wants to use it, I think through um, um, NISA initiative. Um, is that cryo tempo, I think possibly? Um, uh, and so I think it'd be really interesting to um, do it 
look at it for other glaciers, but I think Pine Island is, you know, unique in many respects, actually. And I th uh, what, what we'd like to do next, um, there is that paper literally just published on Friday in Science Advanced by Ian, which shows um, acceleration in the glacier um, in the last two to three years. I think it'd be nice to update our time series with the most recent thinning rates to see if, well, and to monitor, see how that um, thinning evolves um, as the glacier accelerates and whether we go back to sort of the values that we saw in the early 2000s. Thank you. Um, Paolo has another question, but he cannot unmute himself. Yeah, so. yeah. They're, they're very strict about that, aren't they? <laughs> they only let certain people speak. <laughs> So well, oh, maybe you can type it in the chat. Okay, I'm I'm looking at the chat now actually. Um I think he might have just been clarifying his previous question because it came in a few few minutes ago. But oh, <laughs> oh someone says, Can you slide your WebEx menu? Oh right, I didn't realise you were seeing. Oh right, yeah, of course yeah, you were seeing yeah. that. Oh well, yeah. Um, that's something for the next presenters. Um, we know that it's quite difficult to recognize where your web app screen is while you are presenting, but maybe try to shift it. So here comes a question or a curiosity remark. Um, <laughs> he says, give me a task to ask another one. Yes, so yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, it's um, it's a pity Johan um, had to cancel. It sounded like an interesting, interesting study. Okay, well, I, I suggest as there's no other questions, then we say thanks, John. Um, oh, there's one. There's one. How what is? will we be learning from KU and K KA band together, for example, with Crystal? Well, um, I. That's that's quite an involved question, actually, because um, where the radar surface, what what radar surface you're actually um, tracking depends on how you do the retracking, um, you, you know, the approach you take for retracking the data and different groups have different approaches and you can minimize the effect of um, uh, microwave penetration into the snowpack by doing that. Um, I don't think I don't think most of the signal, the vast majority of the signal that we're seeing in Antarctica is, is not related to changes in where that um, radar surface lies. In Greenland, it's certainly more of an issue. I think the KUKA band um, application is going to be particularly useful over sea ice, Arctic sea ice, for getting um, snow thickness um, and therefore, you know, more accurate estimates of freeboard. But in Antarctica, I'm, I mean, there will be some interesting applications looking at, I mean, it will tell us quite a lot about the microwave properties of the snowpack having two frequencies. Um, but in terms of our understanding, if you like, of the glaciology or, you know, the kind of geophysics of different glasses, I'm not sure um, for Antarctica um, if it will have that much impact. Right. So thanks very much, John, for that. Um, so uh, as I mentioned at the start, um, obviously we, we have um, uh, Johan's withdrawn from the second talk. So we'll start again in um, nine minutes time at um, 9.40 CST for um, Anna's talk. So see you very shortly. Thank you. Well, now there is another question from Mark. Um, Jonathan, what about the Arctic wide shelf work for spotting wider impact of the ocean? Yeah. Uh, well, that, that's, a, that's a different talk, Mark. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I could have I could have given that talk. Um, I mean, so it was um, it was a th that what I've just described was just part of a three year um, study on um, mapping um, grounding lines with uh, cryosat swath and pocket data. Um, um, we, uh, 
looking at changes in grounding line um, is is quite tricky if you're using different techniques, and that's something we're looking into at the minute. Um, so actually, it turned out just using cryosat, we we didn't really see any significant changes in um, location of, of grounding lines. Um, I mean, we know about uh, the Amundsen Sea and Bayman area. Um, and we started to look at ISAT data, ISAT2 data, and compare that with our cryosat grounding lines. But that's, you then have to know whether the difference that you're seeing is due to the methodology or the sensor you're using, or whether it's actually a real grounding line migration. And that's quite a tricky one. So uh, that, that, that I think is a work in progress, actually, but it's an important and interesting problem. And there is another question by Ines. Um, did you observe increased damage on the ice shelf from your SWAS data? And she refers to uh, Steph reported an accelerated damage using satellite imagery. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And the honest answer is we didn't really look actually. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether we could how well we would be able to derive increased damage from SWOT data on its own. I think you probably need to combine it with um, um, SAR or maybe even Worldview data or something like that. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's probably you need SAR data, but um, coming from an ice mechanics perspective, I think for assessing instability and progressing changes that would be absolutely worth to to combine yes. with altimetry it would be fantastic uh, it's a good point actually and and it's sort of it, it, it's a follow-up to mal's question what's next i mean i think that that would be really interesting to look at good Oh, mm -hmm. well, I, I'm not sure if, if that if, if that's a good thing or a bad thing that you get lots of time for extra questions. <laughs> I, I think you're safe to to go, John, and, and maybe Johan owes you a beer like next time you uh, you see him. <laughs> yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Thanks for Thank all the questions, you. everyone. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, so I'm pleased to announce or introduce our next talk, which is Anna Hogg from um, University of Leeds. Um, so Anna will be talking about draining and filling um, of an interconnected subglacial uh, lake network in East Antarctica. So Anna, do you want to go ahead and share your screen, please? Thanks a lot, Mel. Um, let's see if this works. Can you see my slides okay? Yeah, it looks great and we can hear you fine. So uh, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you. Fantastic. I can't see the uh, WebEx anymore. So if you have an instruction, you'll have to speak to me. <laughs> I won't be able to see it in the chat. Um, thanks so much um, for inviting me to present at this uh, session. It's a real shame we're not um, in person for this conference, um, but it doesn't diminish at all the achievements of the Cryosat satellite that we're all here to, to celebrate. So I'm really pleased to be a part of that. Um, I'm talking today about um, the draining and filling of an interconnected subglacial lake network in East Antarctica. Um, this is work that was conducted um, as part of uh, a, a number of ESA projects um, from uh, quite a few years ago where we first started using SWAFMODE data to look at various different glaciological applications through to now where we have um, some really quite exciting science results and I hope you'll agree with me about that by the end of this talk. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the work of my co-authors, um, Noel Gormelon, who of course has led the SWAFMODE processing in um, a huge number of ESA projects. Um, along with my colleagues um, Richard Rigby uh, and Thomas Slater at Leeds with me and Bridget um, Wessel who's at DLR who was crucial in, in pulling together some validation data. Um, there's many other colleagues of mine that have contributed to this work over time but um, I'll, I'll just uh, leave it there for now. So active subglacial lakes um, are a really interesting and important part of um, our ice sheets. Um, they play a fundamental role in Antarctica, um, where they are pools of water under the ice sheet um, that can fill and drain on various time scales. When they drain, they can trigger um, a change in ice speed, burst of fresh water input into the oceans, which might affect ocean circulation and currents and evolution of subglacial landforms and subglacial habitats, which are really something that we know very little about even after all these years of study. There are quite a number of previous studies about um, active subglacial lakes. Um, so I want to kind of run through a little bit about those first before I present the results um, for, for my region. Um, firstly, starting in East Antarctica, um, the, the first active subglacial lake event that I think that we really observed using satellites um, was this one in East Antarctica. Um, we used altimetry data to measure the, the filling and draining event of the lake and then um, SAR data was used, uh, or INSAR should I say, to, to measure a slight change in the speed in response to some of that, um, that drainage and that was by Duncan Wingham back in 2006. Um, we can also see from this paper that it wasn't just one lake, there was a number of lakes that were involved in this hydrological system in this, in this basin, in this part, and it showed um, the inklings of a very complicated system that we needed to better understand. There's been a huge amount of work done on the Cypel Coast lakes, again in East Antarctica, um, flowing, well, just inland um, of the Ross Ice Shelf, um, by Matt Siegfried, Helen Frecker, and, and many others uh, in, in the US. Um, this is a subglacial lake activity where there's quite a lot of lakes, some of which are connected, some of which aren't, and they've gone to a tremendous uh, effort to monitor these lakes using satellite data set, but also by instrumenting and placing GPS on, on these lakes. Um, not just for one season, but for really long time periods, which is um, a fantastic resource that enables us to kind of intercompare what we see from space with the reality of, of the changes that happen out on the ground. Um, I don't think that there are any other subglacial lakes in Antarctica that are, are as well monitored in situ as these. Um, I, I'm happy to be corrected on that, but um, yeah, it's a fantastic resource. And the, the exciting thing about the subglacial lakes um, in the Cypel Coast is that um, over the past uh, decade or two, we've now been able to capture multiple filling and drainage events, which starts to give us um, a hint of an understanding about um, how, how they're interconnected. When one lake fills, does a, a, a lake downstream drain? Um, and also the timescale of which filling and drainage may occur. Um, is it decades? Is it years? How, how quickly does it occur? Um, and the Cypel Coast Lakes have given us um, as good an insight into that as we've seen anywhere. 
And then moving on um, to the ISAT era, so ISAT 1 here rather than the, the currently operating ISAT 2, um, there was a great study by Ben Smith and colleagues um, back in 2009 that used the ISAT data set to compile a continent-wide inventory of active subglacial lakes in Antarctica. Um, the, the interesting thing about this inventory is that um, whilst the work that they did was so comprehensive and covered such a large part of the continent, of course, you can only measure activity of subglacial lakes um, if they are active during the time that your satellite is operating. And obviously, because ISAT-1 was only operating between 2003 and 2008, um, there will be many more active subglacial lakes that could not be detected using this technique. Um, and therefore, um, it provides motivation for us to continue studying and doing continent-wide inventories to kind of characterise the changes that are occurring now. Um, I also think that MAL's um, study using the um, ESA Sentinel-3 satellite um, was fantastic. Um, it showed that uh, you can use this new satellite to measure um, active subglacial lake activity. Um, this diagram in the bottom right hand corner shows um, the drainage um, of a, a lake sort of just in land of Totten um, in East Antarctica again. Um, which was fantastic. And I think that the other thing that this paper demonstrated really well is that, you know, there are some subglacial lakes such as Vostok that are very large um, that aren't active and therefore they act as a almost perfect calibration um, site for our, our, our altimetry techniques um, because the lack of activity and the flatness of the surface uh, makes them ideal um, and free from surface slope effects and, and other things that might uh, affect our measurements. So um, great to see that our new sensors, such as Sentinel-3, will be taking up the, the mantle and where there are tracks that cross the, the lakes that they'll be able to use for, for monitoring these effects as well. And then finally, um, the last previous study that I want to touch on is um, work done by one of my PhD students, Heather Selly, um, which was published earlier this year, um, looking at the X region. And um, while this is not a study looking at subglacial lakes, Exactly. Um, there are some interesting results where we found dynamic speed up of glaciers, which is coincident with thinning of those glaciers in this lesser studied Getz region. Um, and those zones of speed up and thinning are actually coincident with where we think some of the faster flowing or more dominant hydrological pathways modelled by Anne Brockatel um, are, as you can see in this top figure. So I think that there's an interesting future question that we really don't know. Um, all the answer to about the role that um, subglacial hydrology plays in, in uh, influencing ice dynamics in Antarctica, um, where the variability of plume driven melting may be important. And you can see in this case that the speed up and the thinning was very concentrated at the grounding line itself, uh, didn't extend to the ice shelf front. Um, and that might provide, um, you know, thought as to the importance of the, the, the subglacial hydrology in this region. Um, but again, more work is definitely needed in this area. And I think that, again, that's an, an exciting um, thing that we can look into in the future uh, as we continue to improve our understanding of subglacial hydrology. So just to summarise, um, we know that subglacial lakes are important. Um, we know that they are distributed across the continent and that they can impact on the ocean, the ice uh, and the subglacial landforms that they sit in. Um, but there are still really large knowledge gaps despite decades of investigation so far in subglacial lakes. We really don't have a good understanding about the timing and frequency of active subglacial lakes in Antarctica. We're really fortunate to have good detailed data sets on a number of lakes that we've studied, or should I say colleagues of ours have studied in detail over the last 10 years, such as the Cypel Coast Lakes. But we don't know if that's representative of subglacial lakes across the continent or whether that's niche behaviour that's only specific to those that region. Um, I think that we have a lack of understanding about the, the physical mechanism that's really responsible for triggering this subglacial lake activity. You know, why does a single lake fill at any one point in time and then suddenly drain? Um, do these drainage events uh, take place over very long time periods or can they be extremely sudden? Um, and again, that sort of speaks to the knowledge gap point one about the timing and frequency of these events. And then how variable is the subglacial water flux under the Antarctic ice sheet? Is this something that really affects East Antarctica way more than West Antarctica? You can see in this map and in this inventory that um, the majority of lakes um, in the map on the right hand side here are, are located either inland or maybe in East Antarctica. And there's not much going on on the peninsula um, or West Antarctica, but that may should be in part due to our lack of um, observations that have enabled us to measure this in those regions, which is certainly more challenging because of their terrain. 
So there's still loads more um, to investigate with regards to subglacial lakes and, and Antarctic hydrology. Um, uh, I think it's an exciting area. And so that's what this study hopefully contributes to. So what did we do? Um, we used um, SWAFMO data set from Cryosat2 to, to process by Noel using the method um, that he published back in 2017. This gives us a, um, a, a high spatial resolution map of elevation changes within the Sarin mode region, which is shown in the map on the left hand side as the yellow shaded area. Um, you can see that um, in this map, uh, it shows you that we're kind of limited to the coastal regions of Antarctica with no swath mode data set of the interior. And there definitely are subglacial lakes that are in both of these regions, um, but that was uh, provided a limit to um, the regions that we can investigate using this technique. But the great thing about the SARIN mode data is that it provides such a vastly increased data volume, um, which enables us to measure surface elevation changes associated with anything in much uh, greater spatial detail. So once we got our swath mode data set, um, we used the plane fit model um, in order to extract measurements of surface elevation change. Um, we uh, we had some thresholds that we kind of had within that plane fit, and I've kind of indicated them in, in the box above. But ultimately, what we got out of that were maps of um, surface elevation change in our study region, which is uh, the Amory Basin um, and just inland by the, um, the glaciers there at the neck. And you can see on the left hand side, there's a map of uh, elevation change over one, the, uh, one subglacial lake um, where the red colour indicates elevation change. And you can see that this is concentrated within the lake boundary, which is indicated by the, uh, the luminous green line. And when we break that down into six monthly chunks and just look at how it changes over time, the, the, the little animation that's running on the right hand side just shows the elevation change um, through time. Um, we were, the study period was uh, 2010 to 2019, so we've got almost a decade of measurements. And you can see from the little animation that this lake is not just um, filling, uh, which is the yellow colour, uh, it's also draining, which is the dark blue colour. What we did then with the plain fit output was that we filtered it. You can see the raw output on the left hand side, which shows that there is some noise um, within that data set and our filtered um, product, um, which is using the filters that are indicated in the bullet points in the um, on the slide, uh, gives a much cleaner result. And I don't think it takes away any of the, the real signal that we were interested in. So it's uh, light but effective filtering. Um, and what does this give us? It gives us um, a map of surface elevation change over this uh, region. So you can see a little bit, bit of a better map here. This is a, a map of the inland neck of the Amory Ice Shelf in East Antarctica. Um, and you can see um, that there's a uh, surface elevation change in the region and there is a number of patches that are particularly dominant. Um, when we, um, one of the things that's important to note about subglacial lake activity and the, the impact on surface elevation change is that the maps themselves don't always show all of the signal. Um, because if you've gone through a full cycle of lake filling and draining, then effectively there'll be zero elevation change in your elevation change maps. So looking at uh, timestamps um, is really important um, and extracting time series um, is really necessary. So we um, did some work using the time series of change on a pixel by pixel basis in order to kind of identify the regions that we thought were um, looked like lakes to us. And um, when we take a profile across a number of lakes, um, so you can see here an example from lakes C and D um, in our numbering, um, and then you extract um, the elevation at that time through that, that grid from a plane fit solution, you can see a clear depression in the height of Lake C um, and an increase in the height of Lake D. So following that, we created time series of elevation change, um, which looked like the, the graph on the left hand side in, in here. Um, and what we did there was we extracted um, a five kilometer region around each lake. Um, we used our manually delineated lake boundaries um, and we extracted the time series from within that lake boundary and then also from the, the non-lake region as well. Um, and so we're very happy to see in this map, uh, in this time series, that the non-lake area showed no or, or close to zero elevation change, whereas all of the elevation change was concentrated within the lake boundaries, you can see by the blue line on this graph. So it would be great if we could automate that step or make it more robust, but at the moment, manual delineation is the best method that I think we've got available to us. Um, there's an interesting question about whether subglacial lakes or the area of a subglacial lake drainage event is the same each time. 
I think there's indications to suggest that it's not. And so um, how do you compare individual lake, lake drainage events through time? Do you read delineate the boundary every 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 time? Um, an interesting methodological um, question that we encountered. Um, and then also we created an error estimate um, associated with this. So here are the results of this study. Um, you can see here that there's um, a time series um, for each of the lakes A through to E, which is a interconnected lake of uh, interconnected network of subglacial lake activity in the Amory region. Um, you can see that the grey line, the light grey line, which is the non-lake region, is is flat in all cases, which gives us good um, um, indication that the um, that the measurement technique is working and that the method is good. Um, but you can see very pronounced um, subglacial lake filling and draining um, in the black lines in a number of these lakes. When we look at it all together, we find a really interesting um, uh, pattern whereby uh, lake, um, the lake that's furthest inland, um, which is D or E, um, it, as it fills um, and then as it drains, the lakes downstream, so C, B and A, fill in response to the drainage event from Lake D, which gives us um, an indication that these lakes are connected. Um, and this is also confirmed by looking at the, the hydrological pathways that were modelled by Anne Um And what we also did actually was to stitch this Cryosat 2 swath mode data to um, the historical radar altimetry records. So we pulled out um, ERS data um, and processed that in exactly the same way to see if we could um, extract similar information from that um, that data archive. The coverage was way poorer. The data is more noisy. It's historical pulse limited radar altimetry data as opposed to high resolution swath mode. But there are some really encouraging results within this. And I think if we focus on Lake D, which had this very pronounced filling and drainage event during the cryosat period, um, we can also see a similar magnitude filling and drainage event um, back in 2000. Um, from the historical radio altimetry data. And that um, is really nice because it starts to give us a bit of an understanding about the, um, the time period that these lake drainage events might happen in this region, which is um, we know nothing about, um, and these are newly discovered lakes. So um, that was really, really nice to see. Um, we validated this data. Um, by um, using TerraSRX data. Um, so Bridget um, made some uh, height change maps from the, the TerraSRX SAR data. Um, it just so happened that um, data was acquired during a time period where our lake was active that overlapped with our Cryosat 2 swath mode data. Um, and you can see the wonderfully smooth, beautiful quality um, elevation change map in the far left hand side um, from Tandem. But the great thing is, is that although, um, you know, we wouldn't have captured anything about the time, um, the, the time series or the, um, the change through time in these lakes using the SAR data, because the, this was, these were the only acquisitions over that period. So although the map itself is um, much cleaner, we wouldn't have gained information about the, the changes over time. But when we reprocess the Cryosat data to directly match the tandem um, time period, uh, we get very good agreement between the elevation change measured by both techniques independently. And you can see that in these two plots in the in the middle, the histogram, and then the, um, the direct difference um, on the right hand side. So that gave us again confidence in our measurements. And it's really the only validation we can do um, that there is no other way we can validate these data sets as far as I'm aware. So you can see here that all 10 lakes in the Amy region are located directly on subglacial hydrological pathways that were modeled by Anne LeBrock. Um, so we, we, we expected there to be kind of water flux in this region, but um, apart from one lake that was identified in the original ISAT inventory, none of the other lakes were identified um, in the current subglacial lake archives. Um, and you can see that this corresponds um, and surprisingly to dips in the bedrock topography. So we're starting to gain a bit of an understanding about what's happening under the ice, even if we um, even if we can't see that directly. One minute, Anna, please. Thanks, Mel. Thank you. It's also interesting to note that in the um the, the network of lakes that we observed, A through to, to E, um, they are also located on one of the faster flowing um glaciers going into the Amory Amory region on Lambert Glacier. Um, and so I think that there's an interesting question of there about whether uh, subglacial lakes are more active if they're located on fast underneath fast flowing ice, whether that creates a more disruptive environment. Um, but um, that's just a thought. And so just to summarize, um, I think that there's um, lots of 
interesting methodological points um, that I'd be interested to discuss with others who have um, done work in this area, such as should subglacial lake boundaries be redrawn every time, or um, and in fact, does the lake area drain differently um, with the, with different events? Um, what's the filling and draining life cycle of the glacial lakes? I think that um, we've seen two different sort of slow fill and fast drain or slow fill and then slow drain types of behaviour. And I'm not sure how individual lakes are, may differ and if different regions maybe more kind of have preference for certain type of behaviour. But we, we, we can only um, understand this in more detail by doing more of these types of studies where we discover new lakes that are active. and get the data and look at it. And so I think that I hope that this work contributes to that. Um, and I think that um, I'm, I was surprised that, that the historical radar altimetry archive did so well on these Amory lakes. You know, they are small regions um, with maybe only one or one and a bit of tracks passing through them, but we were still able to generate good long term multi decadal records of lake change using the data sets. Um, and so there's an interesting study to be done to roll that out across the whole continent, where if we know we've got a, a subglacial lake. I have less confidence that the historical radiometry data could be used for identifying new lakes that we didn't know existed just because the the maps the spatial maps would be so poor um and yes i've got some other interesting points there so i think that there's plenty of um future work with regards to kind of um automating some of this um so we can constantly monitor from space not just using gps sensors um that are put out in situ so i'll leave it there thanks a lot mal Thanks very much, Anna, for a really interesting talk. Um, so we've probably got time for um, a couple of quick questions. So I'll hand over to Andalika to, to pick a couple from the chat. I'm pleased to see that people have started posting them, which is great. Yeah, there is a discussion in the background going on if uh, it would be uh, useful to have SAR in capability um, in these areas. And there has been already a clarification that the crystal mission is planning to have indeed our in data coverage over all of the land ice. So uh, maybe you want to comment how important SAR in over these areas would be. I think it would be game changing. I, I mean, I think it'd be fantastic. You know, um, there would be the only issue that I can envisage would be figuring out exactly how we stitch it to the the current cryosat mode maps. You know, does it disrupt the long term records if we have to uh, match between the 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 modes we currently use in the interior and, and a new SARIN mode of course, but I think that um, we've constantly um, shown that we can innovate and improve and develop our methods for processing altimetry data. And so I don't see why that would be an insurmountable challenge going forward. So I would encourage it. Okay, then there is a question of Mark uh, and the question says, um, is it um, a good approach to use machine learning to detect the undetected lakes? Um, rather than doing the manual discovery intervention and delineation? Yes, definitely. Um, so I think that um, what we what we were investigating in order to try and have a little bit more of an automated way of detecting um, new subglacial lake activity is um, looking at the curviness of the time series. So um, in my opinion, um, the, a time series of elevation change um, that's linked with ice dynamics tends to be sort of in a, in a direction, you know, we've all seen the time series of surface elevation change on Pine Island and Thwaites, you know, where it's a gradual constant decrease in, in ice surface height and equally in Cypel Coast, it's a gradual constant increase in the ice surface height. Whereas the um, the shape of the time series for active subglacial lakes is completely different. You know, it can be completely static with nothing happening, then uh, a sudden increase in elevation and a sudden decrease, it can be more noisy than that, but it's certainly not the same as uh, ice dynamic behaviour um, as we know it. And I think that whilst we can do some basic stuff looking at the curviness of the time series to sort of, um, uh, first of all, identify more likely regions that could be could be surface, uh, could be a subglacial lake, um, and we can complement that with um, the modelled outputs, such as um, there's there's modelling outputs that indicate uh, where there could be ponding underneath the ice sheet. So we can then again filter what might be noisy data at the pixel level by using those auxiliary measurements to pick them out. But certainly if we were to then put those time series and confront them with machine learning techniques um, rather than trying to use more traditional scientific analysis, then I, I can see that there could be a step change um, in, in our ability to detect new lakes, which would be really exciting. I think that 
that to be done for sure. And he has another question, uh, which is how significant are the volume of water involved here by comparison to lake drainage and filling and waste? By comparison to what, sorry? To, to the West Antarctic ice sheet. So comparison of the volume of the water in that area that you presented compared to the water volume involved in drainage and filling in the West Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, so my lack of understanding about whether this is to do with the subglacial lakes that have been detected in West yeah. Antarctica, or it's the loss of ice mass in general in, an, in West Antarctica. I'm a bit unclear as to what the focus of the question there is. But what I will say is that the size of the lakes is is comparable. You know, that these aren't a new Lake Vostok. They're relatively small, um, only several kilometres across rather than, you know, hundreds of kilometres across. Um, and so the, the height change it, it's not a uh, height change that's out of sync with, you know, it's not the biggest height change we've ever seen from a subglacial lake, you know, in in our observational records. Um, you know, if anything, actually, I like the Amory lakes because they aren't, you know, the biggest or, you know, the most vo water volume, but it's about the detail of the behaviour, you know, that we can detect these relatively small features, and they are relatively small features, using measurements from space that are, you know, 700 kilometers above the Earth's surface and uh, and that we can kind of see how it interlinks and it helps us understand the actual glaciological process that's happening there beneath the ice. Um, so does that answer the question? I think that answers the question. Um, there is another question, but I have a, a very short one com uh, which follows on to that. What elevation change would you start to consider to be a lake drainage compared to another type of elevation change event is it 50 centimeters a meter from where on would you consider it to be a lake drainage so i think that's a really good question and i think that um i guess my answer is an opinion rather than a fact you know that we could take away just because another person might have a different uh, opinion on this i think it's more about sort of the the time period of the behavior you know the how you characterize the behavior over time rather than the actual absolute amount of change so for example if you've got a region where you've only got a meter of change um but it's it's clearly cyclical and in, in it looks like lake d did where there was a, a filling and a draining and then nothing and then a filling and a draining and nothing if that was only a meter um in height as opposed to several meters which is what we saw then i would still be interested in classifying that as lake drainage behavior rather than something else um if if it was behavior that looked like long-term thinning or long-term thickening um, but it was, uh, you know, nine meters a year, as we've seen on, on Pine Island, perhaps, you know, but it's consistent, then that would, I would class that as dynamic behavior rather than anything that's to do with subglacial lake activity, because it's not that variable uh, and periodic bursts of activity, I guess. Okay, thank you. And then the last question comes from Peter Nino. Um, he says, I wonder what processes you think may occur and what and on what timescales and that would change the magnitude and frequency of these uh, lake subglacial drainages to induce a step change in their future behavior and impacts. Since these events have presumably been happening under normal conditions for a very long time, say it's driven by basal melt rate fluxes. Yeah, that's a great question, um, as to be expected from Pete. Um, I, I, I think probably if we had a, a session in a in a coffee shop or a pub, that would be um, the amount of time we'd need to sort of dig into that one. Um, I think that the answer would be different depending on where the lakes are located. Um, you know, in a lake that's really inland, um, you you'd expect in in an isolated way away from some external forcings, then then. Uh, I, I wonder whether you've got to like erode the bed topography in order to have any kind of real change in the frequency of lake drainage, you know, um, events of that lake. Whereas if you've got a subglacial lake that's actually quite close to the grounding line, it's actually on a region of relatively fast flowing ice. If you get changes in the speed that that ice stream is flowing, or if you get uh, thinning of the ice shelf um, in the vicinity of it, that, that, that could, you know, I could expect that that would be a much more dynamic and much more um, uh, able to freely change uh, lake environment um, that could that where the behavior could change over time. I think um, that would probably be my feeling. And so, yeah, I guess I would I would suggest that 
the lakes that are closer to the grounding line might be the ones that are more more uh, prone to change and that would be even more interesting to study and certainly um I think a really important future area of investigation is to understand how these bursts of fresh water, when they're released from a lake drainage event, do they reach the ocean? If they do reach the ocean, do they either generate a new plume that can driven turbulent driven melting underneath uh, on an ice shelf? Um, if they can enhance an existing plume, you know, what does that look like? And does that signal then, is it only temporary? Um, or does it last for many months and can it have a, a real impact? And, um, you know, if that's happening in a really important area uh, with a very broken a glassy with a very broken shelf like Thwaites, for example, you know, does that melt event from a, a, a hidden, supposedly not interesting subglacial lake affect the stability of the ice tank that's already quite broken? So, look, I think there's so many exciting questions that we can start to investigate when we've got good records of subglacial lake activity. Yeah, I, I fully agree. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I think we um, that was the last question. It's a very vivid discussion here, which is very nice. Um, and uh, we thank you again. And then there is uh, uh, the next talk coming up, which is by uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Churter um, from the Bristol University. And the talk is about the Antarctic Peninsula mass trends from 2003 until present using a Bayesian hierarchical model approach. Yeah, you can see your can, can you hear me? And, and can, can you me? see my slides? They are not yet, yeah, now perfect. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Mal and Angelica, for having me to talk today. Um, so, Today, I'm going to give an overview of some work that we've just recently wrapped up um, as part of my postdoctoral research role on the ERC Global Mass Project. And the aim of what we've tried to do is to take as many observations um, of ice sheets, um, elevation change and mass change that we can and integrate them into a joint Bayesian um, inversion to better understand what's going on in the Antarctic Peninsula over the last two decades. Um, so, why are we interested in the Antarctic Peninsula? Well, firstly, it's become an increasingly significant component of the Antarctic contribution to sea level rise, as we've seen through previous recent review studies from Van Brettel and also the recent INBI assessment. But in addition to that, we also have seen quite a notable change in the dynamics of this area of Antarctica, such as widespread observed grounding line retreat um, from grounding line mapping from Fraser Christie a few years ago, and also increases in ice sheet velocity from several input output method mass budget studies over the last two decades. Um, in addition to that, the Northern Antarctic Peninsula, as we know, had the um, Larsen A and Larsen B ice shelf collapses at the turn of the, uh, turn of the century. And being able to monitor the dynamic response of this region as um, it responds to the loss of buttressing of the ice um, of the ice shelves, it's really key for understanding not only the ice shelf, the ice sheet dynamics in this region, but also potential responses for other, in other areas of Antarctica to similar events, which may be under the susceptibility to um, mechanics such as marine ice sheet instability. However, despite the region's importance, the geometry and topography makes it really challenging for remote sensing observations and also regional climate models um, to assess the mass balance. Um, and that basically means it's very difficult for us to get a pin down accurately what the mass balance is at an annual basis. And also, so not only that, but identify what are the underlying driving processes that are driving the change in mass balance in the region. So for the purposes um, of our study, we took the Antarctic Peninsula as the definition as defined by IMB from the Rinio basins. So on the figure on the left here, you can see the purple, three purple basins make up the Antarctic Peninsula as we define it. But I've also included the Abbott Basin here shown in orange because there's been some really interesting changes in dynamics um, in the Frigno and Fox Ice streams over the last two decades. So when we typically think of mass balances, I'm sure this is everyone uh, knows, uh, there's basically three conventional approaches that we typically use. Um, and the first of which is gravimetry, which is with, since the launch of GRACE in 2003, and that's really transformed um, our ability to get high temporal resolution estimates of mass change um, over the Antarctic ice sheet. And what the gravim what, um, what gravimetry studies do is measure the change in mass due to SMB 
ice dynamics and also changing the bedrock due to GIA. Um, however, over the Plinza, it does suffer um, from the fact that because it is at a 300 kilometre, roughly 300 kilometre resolution, the geometry of the region means that the course uh, sampling can't necessarily pinpoint exactly where some of these small scale um, mass changes are occurring, especially in like outlet Vassit or valley glasses that we see over the northern Antarctic Peninsula. And in addition, because the um, peninsula is located next to areas such as Emmons and Sea Embayment, which has undergone really quite rapid changes and large mass losses, you can get some signal leakage between basins as well. Um, altimetry is one of our, as we know, one of our longest records of um, measuring the state of the ice sheet, and that measures the combination of all ice sheet processes, um, SMB, fern compaction, ice dynamics, and vertical uplift due to GIA. Um, however, altimetry can struggle, particularly pre-Cryosat 2, um, due to simply the latitudinal position of the um, Antarctic Peninsula, leading to quite large cross-track spacing. Um, and in addition to that, we also have uh, the mountainous topography, which leads to data loss, particularly around the areas near the grounding line and the margins of the ice sheet, where most of the dynamic um, dynamic events are happening. Um, in addition to that, as well, we have to go from elevation change to mass change, and where we can use models such as Rackmo, for example, any sort of bias or uncertainty in these models is propagated through, and that's quite an issue in the peninsula because modelling over uh, the climate over regions with such high um, heterogeneous topography is really difficult. Um, and finally, we have the mass budget approach. And the mass budget um, takes the SMB um, coming into the ice sheet and differences it with discharge at the grounding line. And whilst this is really the only method that directly observes the different processes, go, well, directly can split the different processes going on, um, again, you have the issue with SMB models over this region needing to be very high resolution to resolve some of these small scale changes, but also Ice fitness at the grounding line is only defined by observations for approximately 70% of the Antarctic Peninsula. And this is one of the biggest error terms in the, in the mass budget technique. And that's sort of proven over the last couple. There's been a couple of assess, different assessments using the IM approach where the absolute discharge um, in this region differs by over 100 gigatons. So picking the appropriate baseline is really important to get an accurate mass balance estimate. And uh, when this sort of bears itself out in the recent Antarctic um, INBI assessment, where we took, where where the team took all the um, submitted estimates of mass balance and combined them to give a, uh, an integrated estimate of mass change over the Antarctic Peninsula for the last um, well, since the nine, 1992. And uh, there's large variations in mass balance, as you can see. The black lines here in the top plot are the mean for each year, but the grey lines are the are the spread the spread between studies. Um, and there's not only large differences between different conventional approaches, but also within each approach itself. So in the subplot here, this is breaking it out into its individual component, uh, individual conventional approaches. And you, as you can see, our timetry is generally on the more positive end and mass balance. Gravimetry is somewhere in the middle and the input output method typically is on the more negative side. Um, and for the 2003 to 2010 period, uh, the approaches don't each individual approach does not necessarily agree with an uncertainty. And also for some basins, observations from the same sensor using uh, over the same time period um, do not agree with an error for the Southern Antarctic Peninsula. So we thought, is there anything really that our model can add to this debate and sort of shed some light of what's going on and also the driving processes? Um, so just a quick overview of the model that we use. The model is a three layer um, Bayesian hierarchical model, which is split into the first layer is the observations. So this is where we take all observations we have of I this change in the state of the ice sheet. So elevation rates from altimetry, DEM differencing we can utilize over um, the Antarctic Peninsula and also data from GRACE and GRACE FO. And what we do is we feed these into the model and define each latent process occurring on the ice sheet, which we can tailor the meshes to better resolve in areas where we believe it's more likely to occur. And a key part of our model as well is the prior information. And what this does is it takes existing auxiliary models such as RACMO um, or measures of ice velocity and feeds this into the model. And basically what this does is it helps the framework to separate um, more, better estimate which process, the decomposition of these signals into their appropriate processes. So for example, where we have widespread um, 
where we have fast ice speeds um, as shown in measures, that indicates the model is more likely to be changes due to ice dynamics than in the interior of the ice sheet. But what's important to note is we're not actually using the mag absolute magnitude outputs of these models, we're just using it to uh, give an idea of the spatiotemporal properties of each process. Um, but for, since this model was applied over the whole ice sheet um, in the Martin Espanol study of 2016, there's been quite a few model improvements since then. And the major one really is that previously ice dynamics, the temporal evolution of the process was defined as a linear or quadratic model, which is fine for decade studies. But as Jonathan showed in his talk this morning, that the dynamics is not necessarily linear or quadratic in its behavior. So what we've done is implemented an AR1 process with quite a, um, a strong temporal smoothing dependence. And what that does is it still indicates that we expect the change in ice to be ice dynamics to be smooth in time, but it gives it much more flexibility to vary and not be pre-prescribed by the model. Um, in addition, we've used higher resolution meshes to um, because we were modeling a smaller region and also optimized priors for the region. Um, in terms of data sets, we've really leveraged the um, Cryotempo Eolis SWOF data products from Noel's um, group. And this has been a real um, kind of boon for our study because it's a main driver of the framework for post 2010. And the SWOF data gives us orders of magnitude, more observations over the Southern Antarctic Peninsula than what we had before. Um, but in addition, because our model doesn't necessarily have to have spatially continuous information going into it, we've been able to leverage data sets such as tandem XD and differencing and also other localized studies over the Northern Antarctic Peninsula in this panel here on the right. Um, and we've also used the NASA JPL MassCon solution from GRACE and GRACE FO. And in terms of temporal coverage, um, the GRACE GRACE FO is quite important because it gives us an, uh, an, uh, a chance to demonstrate whether our model can actually bridge these gaps between different um, satellite missions where we have data gaps, and that could be quite important going into the next decade if we have gaps in the altimetry record, for example. Um, so for the years 27, so for the years 2018, 20, so 2017, 2018 of our study, we don't have any GRACE data. So it was interesting to see how our data would cope with that. But it also demonstrates sort of a flex, one of the key flexibilities of our framework in that because we're using elevation rates for each process, they don't necessarily have to overlap in time. So we can pull in a wide sort of array of data sets. Um, in terms of results, so this is for the whole Antarctic Peninsula sector um, as a whole, um, we find that over the 2003 to 2019 period, the mean mass imbalance of the region was minus 19 gigatons a year. Um, and when we decompose that into its separate components, ice dynamics is pretty much driving the long-term trend in this signal almost all of it, and there's no clear discernible trend in SMB. However, that only tells really part of the story. So uh, this plot here is um, the green is the change in mass trends due to ice dynamics as estimated by our model. And SMB is the trends in, um, so the orange is the trend, trends in SMB as predicted by our model. Um, and as you can see, the ice dynamics start from a near below zero state in 2003, and it accelerates quite rapidly up to the middle of the 20, up until 2010 and 11, and then sort of reaches a new state of disequilibrium or slows down thereafter. Um, and when we plot these against um, mean discharge anomalies uh, from the recent uh, Rinyo et al. mass budget study, we see there's quite a good agreement in the temporal evolution of the process, um, despite the fact there's a little bit of a bias between their approach and um, our results. And when we compare the SMB to these dots here are from different climate models over the region. So these are um, SMB anomalies with respect to a long-term baseline. We find that our model does a pretty good job of representing the interaction variability in the process, although for some years there is quite um, market difference between the models and really the SMB while it's not responsible for the main trends in the region at the interannual scale it basically governs the mass balance of the region so in 2007 we have almost a minus 50 gigatons per year but in 2016 where we have a strong El Nino um, event it basically flips the whole um, mass balance of the region to positive for that year um, so that's sort of one of the key abilities of our model is it can decompose it into its component parts and see well really what is the long-term response of the region. When we take the Antarctic Peninsula and break it down into its individual basins, um, we see quite an interesting pattern emerging. So for example, the Abbott Ice Shelf, uh, Abbott Sector region, 
and the southern Antarctic Peninsula, we find that ice dynamics is quite a big driver um, of the mass trends, long-term driver of the mass trends, um, accelerating over the period of the study with SMB superimposed over the top. Um, uh, when, when we compare that to the um, eastern side of the southern Antarctic Peninsula, which drains into the Weddell Sea, we see pretty much a um, no ice dynamics response with SMB just governing the mass balance of the region. And that's quite interesting because it sort of points to the fact that there's a common oceanic forcing component going on with drainage sectors in the Bellingshausen sea sector, where the circumpolar deep water is um, much larger, so much greater than in the Weddell Sea, which is close to the freezing point. Um, and really, the northern Antarctic Peninsula is the main driver of ice dynamics over the whole region. And this is predominantly due to the collapse in the ice shelf. So a lot of the um, ice dynamics we see going on in this region is where the Hectoria green glacier, for example, um, has sped up off, over the ice shelf after the ice shelf collapse. Um, so this is the spatial outputs of um, our model. So this is the changes in elevation rate that our model believes is due to ice dynamics um, for four time slices over the 17 year period. And we see a sort of evolution that we've seen um, in where we believe it's happened in other studies. So for example, we see over the Fox and Frigno ice streams, um, a quite strong mass losses and height, uh, height changes due to ice dynamics, which corroborates really well with the ice shelves in these regions that are undergoing some of the largest thinning rates across the whole continent. Um, but we also see the emergence of the dynamic thinning over the small, uh, over the Southern Antarctic uh, Peninsula for uh, ice shelves draining into the um, George the Sixth Fire Shelf, which has been seen by studies from Bert Wouters um, and others. Um, and we also see strong thinning over the Wordy Ice Shelf, where the ice shelf collapsed in the 1990s. And it's quite difficult to see in this plot, but we also see the, so the really strongest um, thinning rates due to ice dynamics are again over the glasses that drains the Larsen B embayment. So it gives us confidence that the model is picking up the signals we would expect, um, especially over the Northern Antarctic Peninsula. When we look at um, the surface mass balance, um, so on the left here is a um, plot from the uh, Basin hierarchical model. So that's the elevation changes due, that it believes is due to surface mass balance on the left. And this is the output from RACMO in 2016 on the right. And this is the year where we had the strong El Nino events. This is sort of an extreme example. Um, and basically, BHM replicates the broad patterns from the RCMs in that it places most of our mass gains in the Southern Antarctic Peninsula. Um, however, the, we, our BHM does show a lower overall accumulation than the RCM, which is not to be unexpected considering our model is driven by um, observation, satellite observations as opposed to the physical representation of the climate processes in a forward model. But it can be quite a useful tool to just compare the models and see where there are disagreements between approaches and maybe where we need to look at both, uh, investigate the differences between both. Um, so when we put our results into context over the Antarctic, for the Antarctic Peninsula as a whole, we find um, that so in the boxes here are basically time average studies from several papers over the last 20 years. Um, and we find that our trends sort of sit quite well within the middle of, of those spreads. Um, but you can even see here before 2010, you see that the input output methods generally more negative, um, whereas altimetry data tends to sit on the more positive end. Um, and when we compare it to the running um, time series from the recent INVI estimate, we find that there's quite good temporal um, agreement in the in the variations in the mass trends, and they agree quite well with for quite a few of the years. Um, on the whole, though, our estimates are slightly on the more positive compared to MB, which is not unexpected simply because, um, as I said in some of my introduction slides, the MB uh, uses mass budget estimates with an equal weighting, which are more negative, so we're bringing the average down. Um, but it just goes to show that having two different approaches for combining these observations through the INVI study and also through our approach gives a reasonably similar results and gives us confidence that we're actually getting quite a good handle on what's going on um, in the region. Um, and to finish off one area that I wanted to focus on was focus on the Southern Antarctic Peninsula, because this is an area where there's been quite a lot of um, debate and variation between studies, even from the same approach. So on the left, hand side here is on the grounded ice is the change in ice dynamics due to 
change in height due to ice dynamics from our model from the year 2016. And on the ice shelves, we have the net ice shelf mass balance from um, Sue Shields paper back in 2018. And we find there's a really good spatial corroboration between our ice dynamics uh, finning and the largest rates of ice shelf finning over the Georgian 6 region. Um, but when we look at the uh, differences in ice sheet velocity from the measures program for this, we take the mean from 2011 to 2017 and difference that with the mean from 05 to 11. And we find that there's really, the velocity is quite static over most of the region, apart from in uh, concentrated outlet glaciers, which is similar to what um, Anna saw in her, in her recent paper. And what that leads us to believe is that there is spatially coincident processes going on. So we have ice dynamics as well as SMB operating in the same space, um, and which could explain why there's quite an array of differences from altimetry studies over this region, because it really depends on the volume to mass conversion approach that you use. So, for example, if you use a um, ice dynamic masking, you will miss and you don't mask these areas, you will just miss these areas of dynamic thinning. Um, but if you use the output from a climate model, you can easily propagate the biases, any sort of biases or uncertainty from those climate models into um, your results. So we think that there's um, value in our model approach and given an indication of where um, we think these competing processes are going on and where we probably need to um, come up with newer methods and better ways of really doing the volume to mass conversion from altimetry data. Um, so looking ahead um, to the future roadmap, um, the change that we've made in the model means that we can now run this over multiple decades um, and going into the future with Crystal, its launch in the um, in this decade would be really crucial in terms of carrying on the altimetry record. But also we're looking to incorporate data sets such as ISAT2 and also Sentinel-3 and Sentinel-3A and B, which would give us some really good, nice um, elevation trends in the interior of the ice sheet. So this is ongoing work and just demonstrates some of the potential that we have can go into the future, because really this air region proves that we really need to have long-term continuous time series to understand really what's going on in the region. Um, so those are my conclusions and I'll just leave those up there, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. So well, I can't um, see the questions. <laughs> so, so we don't yeah. have any questions um, in the chat. Um, so maybe I'll ask a brief one and then maybe we'll move on as I'm conscious we are a bit behind time. So you, you yeah. seem to show that um, you saw a bias between um, the Rinio discharge and yours. Do you have any uh, feel for what might be causing that? Yeah, so um, if I quickly go back, you mean um, that plot there? That yeah. One. Yeah, so um, I mean, so from Alex Gardner's study and Eric Rinio's here, there is a hundred gigaton difference between the absolute discharge um, for the same time period. Um, and what Eric does, he takes a baseline and then calculates discharge anomalies from that baseline. But for areas where there aren't any observations, you just you have to assume really the region's in balance and that might not necessarily hold. So, I mean, the biases aren't huge over that time period, but they're um, it, it very much depends on what you pick as your baseline. So um, one of the selling points really of our study is it doesn't really rely on sort of an arbitrarily defined balanced state of the ice sheet because we're using trends um, anyway. But um, yeah, and also the um, error bars on the IOM study are quite large. So they do agree, but um, I think the offset could simply be due to what we define, what they define and what we define as a balanced state. Great, thank you very much. All right, and thank you again. And we will come then to the last talk of this morning session. And we welcome Dr. Gisela Picard from the University um, Grenoble des Alpes. And it is a specialist talking um, on the new altimetric module for the snow microwave transfer model. I hope everything works well with setting up the presentation. Yeah, do you hear me? We can hear you well. Okay, so now let's try to share the screen. Yeah, it 
it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. Good. Okay. So do you see the first slide? Um, I can't see the first slide yet. Probably takes a minute. No. It's... Can you please try I again? To share? Yeah. That's coming. So. Yeah, we can see your slides. Okay, let's see. And now, Perfect. even better. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Set. Yeah. Um, okay, it's a very different talk from the previous one where we have seen very beautiful uh, maps and, and results about the change in Antarctica. What I'm going to talk about is, uh, is more about uh, uh, altimetric movements uh, and the kind of thing we need to prepare the future and to understand uh, more, more sophisticated uh, measurements. Um, it's about a new altimetric module that has been implemented in the Snow Microwave Radiative Transfer Model. And I'd like to thank my co-authors. Some of them um, have been involved in this new development. Uh, others have been involved in the initial SMRT uh, development. And uh, the last uh, pair, uh, they, have been, uh, they are involved in testing uh, this new altimetric module. Um, First, uh, I'd like to, to explain a bit where SMRT is coming from and to see uh, the potential of this model for the future. Uh, it's about five years ago we have been uh, involved in the, in the Micro Snow ESA project. Um, the, pro the, the project was really theoretical. It was about the signature of the snow and we were interested by the snow microstructure. Um, during that project, we decided to develop a new model uh, to to take into account and to investigate the effect of the microstructure on scattering. Uh, the initial model was mainly used for passive microwave, but it was also able to do some active model. When I say active here, I don't mean altimetry, I, I mean uh, total backscatter radar, like a SAR or scatterometers. Um, in uh, 2018, we had an opportunity to, to, to develop the, the medium part of the, of the model, and we added a sea ice module. Um, and as a product, uh, we got fresh and lake um, Two years ago, uh, we, three years ago, um, we had another project uh, in the framework of the preparation. And this is a uh, development of the meter module I'm going to talk about, and we did some validation in the, in the validation. So this is also what we're going to talk about. And uh, since uh, 2020, we had two projects to, to test, to further test this model. So the, the, the talk is mainly about the development. The, the first question is, is why do, did we need a, a new model? Uh, because we already had very good models. Uh, the community, uh, in, especially in passive microwave, uh, is using MEMERS, HUT, uh, DMRT uh, theory uh, models, and they are widely used, and some of them are also active. Uh, so none of them were was able to 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 do to work for the altimetry, but uh, they were really well tested, robust models. On the other hand, uh, we have we had uh, some altimetry models, but they were not really uh, widely used because well, usually people just had them on, on the hard disk, but not uh, it was not op they were not open source or, or and so on. Um, what is common to all these uh, uh, models, they describe the snowpack as a stack of horizontal layers, uh, as you can see on the right. Um, and the, the first task in this model is to convert uh, the snow properties into scattering and absorption properties and propagation properties in, in every layer. And then uh, a second step is to propagate the wave uh, through the medium, so either due to the microwave emission or due to the radar wave uh, reflection. Um, SMRT is not that different from the previous models. If, if in this perspective, from a science point of view, um, 
it's the, the only improvement is the way the, the microstructure, the snow microstructure is, is described. And this is, I would say, something for specialists. Uh, but in practice, uh, uh, I think SMRT is, 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 a new, is nevertheless a new generation model because in practice it is very inconvenient, uh, very convenient to use, very much, much easier to use, and also it's much easier to extend, and you're going to see that it was a critical point for, uh, for, for the development we have done here. Uh, the reason why it, it is uh, easy to use and easy to develop is because uh, very early in the development, we, we, we ask ourselves uh, a very important question, a very fundamental question, uh, what is a, a, micro, a snow microwave, a microwave radiative transfer and what, what are the component? And the result of this um, uh, brainstorming was a highly structured architecture. Um, so for us, uh, such a model is has different component and they are very independent from each other. So first we have something that describes a snowpack as I said, as, as layers, uh, but layers, they, are, they, are, they have a different microstructure, they can have different microstructure, and they have different ma materials with different permittivities. Uh, also between the layers, we have different kind of interface, uh, flat or rough, uh, and also we have boundaries uh, conditions uh, above and below. Um, uh, also, we, we have a sensor configuration, and in the end, we have a model. Uh, so in, by model, I mean here the model, the computation part of the model that is able, that is in charge of doing the calculation. And as I said before, the first step is to calculate the scattering properties for, for every layer and, and every and that is transfer the the energy wave through the And this is a solver part, and this is what is important for the following. Um, the, the, the orange box here, uh, boxes here, um, in, in SMRT, uh, we propose different options uh, for, uh, so we can select between different options and we propose different options and they are very easy to, to extend. Um, this is uh, here, this is another view of the same uh, structure. Uh, but the, here the difference is that in, uh, in dark orange, you have the, the previous boxes. Um, but in, in light orange, you have all the options offered by uh, SMRT uh, as of today. Uh, you can see, for instance, on, on, the, on the right, you have the permittivity box with and, and, and so on. And on the other side, you, on the on the left side, you have the empty solver box. And as I said, it's it's an important one because initially we only had the dot um, solver, uh, which is a box called dot. And uh, this box was able to do uh, calculation for the passive microwave and the total backscatter. So what I call active here. Uh, because of this, uh, SMRT was not able to do uh, computation of the of the altimetric uh, form as, as as we can get with observation, and this is where we we did the measure the, the improvement. So we implemented this uh, NADI altimetry module, um, and the the good thing about this uh, huge structure and this uh, very well organized structure is that uh, adding this altimetry um, module directly opens many perspectives. Because all the different options in, in all the, the other boxes are strictly available. So, for instance, snow, sea ice, lake ice can be modeled and applied to the altimetric uh, uh, module. Uh, um, okay, what, what, what is this module? So, this module is called Nadir LRM Altimetry. And in fact, it's a, it's a computation in two steps. Um, we, we have seen on, uh, on Tuesday in this conference uh, several uh, um, uh, representation of the of the waveform, and usually the waveform is is uh, uh, a convolution of different terms. And here, uh, the first term is a is to compute uh, the vertical profile of backscatter. Uh, so it's to compute the contribution from the surface, from the volume, so from the so snow or from uh, bubbly ice and and so on. Uh, also, the, the backscatter from the uh, interlayer interfaces when we have a strong contrast, like uh, for instance, between snow and, and, and sea ice. 
Um, and also the back setup from the background for terrestrial snow, for instance. Um, the main approximation here is that we only compute first order backscatter, so we don't have multiple scattering. The second step is to is to is is the second term in this convolution in this area of convolution is to take into account the the fact that we have a, a wave front and the wave front uh, propagation causes a delay of the echo. Um, here uh, we have uh, applied the, the the original model proposed by Braun in, in 1977, and uh, as a consequence, the the, the module works uh, only for flat and uh, or slightly tighter, uh, tilted uh, surface, but it doesn't work for very rough surface or very complex surfaces. Um, so in in practice, it means that the, uh, the current module only works with the LRM mode and without uh, any complex topography. Um, as usual with SMRT, we try to separate and to organize things in a, in a very uh, highly structured uh, way. So in practice, the two steps are really uh, independent uh, and they, they, can, they can be improved without changing the other part. So it's good for the, for the future if we want to, to, solve, uh, to, to remove some approximations. Uh, to illustrate the calculation, I, I've made an example here with a snowpack with four layers. Um, the, the layers have different grain size and density, and they, I, I set up the, the, the snowpack to, as, a, as to increase the, the scattering uh, strength with, uh, with depth. You can see the layer on the first, uh, on the first um, uh, graph with the, the, the small um, black uh, lines. Um, so the first step of calculation, as I said, is, is assuming is only the vertical uh, backscatter component. So it's like as, assuming that the, the altimeter has a very, uh, uh, and, uh, and we get uh, the read echo, um, the function of depth. So we know the contribution of each layer interface the second step is to propagate this in time. So it's, it just means to take, to take into account the, the velocity of the wave in, in, the, in the medium. Uh, it's uh, more than in, in the air, but it's less than in the ice. And then the last step is to, to, to perform the convolution with the horizontal spread of the wave. So it's, it's, now it's taking into account the beam uh, and, the, and the altimeter characteristic. And we end up with a, with a total uh, backscatter, which is made of different components. And with the model, we can easily uh, investigate the different components, uh, which is the surface, the volume. By volume, I mean uh, grain, si grain scattering, and the interfaces, so the intralayer, interlayer uh, uh, reflection due to the contrast of, uh, of, uh, of the dielectric constant. Um, the next step and the, the most important uh, step was uh, to, to try to do validation. Uh, for that, uh, because I, I, I'm mostly working in, uh, in Antarctica on the, on, the, on the plateau and the ice sheet, uh, we decided to, to perform this, uh, this validation in this context. Um, uh, I participated to uh, two traverses in, in East Antarctica in, uh, in four years ago and two years ago, and we collected uh, all the data necessary to, to perform this uh, validation with a very accurate uh, uh, with very accurate measurements. Uh, you can see that uh, we have a very large uh, latitudinal spread of the, of the measurement, um, and this is important to, to, to have different to get different conditions. This is a type of uh, measurement we have uh, collected. And here I have selected only the seven sites with the highest uh, quality of measurement. And for all of them, we have uh, the, the slope at the kilometer scale. Uh, it's derived from uh, the RIMA uh, data uh, DEM. Uh, we have the mean temperature, me measured mean temperature. We have the roughness. We have the mini measurement uh, with photogrammetry. And also we have profiles of grain size and density at 10 centimeter resolution down to at least eight meters. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of data. And this is exactly the data we need uh, for, the, for, the, for the simulations. So now uh, the result. 
Uh, we have done the calculation, the simulation for uh, several sensors, so Altica and Vsat in KU and S band, and uh, Sentinel 3A. Uh, Sentinel 3A on the plateau is working in LRM mode, so it's uh, it's compatible with uh, with the module. And here on the the re you can see the result for these different satellites and uh, and and bands. Uh, in terms of total backscatter estimated with a SMRT. Uh, and uh, so you can see that um, the correlation is, is quite good for the seven sites uh, at all the bands. Uh, and the, I think w w one important result here is, uh, is a contrast between the site on the, the Azuma sites, they are more coastal, uh, and the east uh, site, uh, which correspond to the, to the to the traverse in the direction of, of South Pole from Dome C, so much more, much more, much higher latitude, much higher on the plateau. Uh, you can see that the the sigma, uh, the backscatter increases with uh, uh, with uh, towards the interior of the of the ice sheet. Um, and what is good with the model, because the, with the observation you can also observe that you, you get this information. But what is good with the model is you can get reason why you get this uh, this change. And the model says that uh, the surface roughness is a main factor because it's becoming um, uh, smoother in the interior. And this is the main reason why we have this increase of, of, of backscatter. But the grain size, density, and temperature also plays in, play in the same direction, but they are less significant, but still uh, not negligible. Next step is to compute the, the waveforms. Uh, so I'm sorry, the, the graph is not very easy to read here. Um, I, I have put a, a, a QR code if you if you want to have it on a, on a better screen. Um, here, I'm, I'm not going to detail because it's too difficult to, 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 to uh, analyze the, the waveform. But basically, uh, we, we, if you compare the, the, the black and the blue lines, uh, the simulation in KA band are very good. Uh, in KU band, it's a bit more problematic, uh, but still it's quite good. And in S band, it's, it's, it's easy. Um, it's really because the KU band is something in between where scattering uh, between the volume and the surface and everything is more com complex in, uh, in KU band, I would say. Um, okay, so the next slide, in the next slide we have um, we have computed the different the total contribution of each uh, of each uh, con contributor, so like the surface, the volume, and the and the interfaces. And I think it's a it's an interesting result uh, because you can see uh, the change of the contributors with the with the with the band. So uh, the conclusion that is that uh, on the in on the plateau, uh, the surface backscatter dominates at all the frequencies. But uh, the volume scattering is still uh, about 40% of the signal in, in KIA band and less uh, at lower frequencies. Um, so for, for many people, um, this is a very surprising result because they expect that, that uh, Altica is, is in the surface rather than the volume. But this is important to explain why we have this uh, result here. Um, with the model, we can also estimate the, the typical depths from which uh, the signal is coming. And here uh, we have in K band a penetration depth of about 50 centimeters. Uh, so it means that the volume echo is higher, uh, but it's coming from a, uh, it has a, a smaller penetration depth. So it's coming from, a, from near the surface. Whereas in, in KU band, the contribution of the volume is small, but the, the penetration depth is a few meters. And this is why it seems that the volume, the volume can be separated from the surface. Um, said like this, it's easy to conclude that it's very difficult to, to know if in the end uh, the signal is, is the bias, the elevation bias, so the, due to the penetration is going to be higher in KU band or KA band, uh, because it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off between the depth of penetration and the strength of, uh, of, the, con of the volume contribution. So I have another slide which shows that, oh, it's not here. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, so the, the other slide, uh, on this slide, we, we can see the, that, in fact, for the, for the two bands, there is almost a compensation. 
Uh, the elevation based bias is estimated to about 10 centimeters uh, on average. And on, in some sites, uh, the Kaya band has a higher elevation base uh, bias, and on other, it's the opposite. And there is no, no very clear trend. So it just means that uh, it's a very subtle uh, compensation between many factors like uh, the surface, the roughness, uh, the grain size, temperature, and density. And I think it's why it's very difficult to predict uh, what the elevation ba bias is going to be. Uh, and I think also it's why the, the model uh, can be useful to, to try to, to understand uh, better and to predict in some, uh, in some future uh, uh, what is this elevation. Um, if I have uh, time, is, is to present first uh, uh, result we have on uh, on uh, on frozen lakes. This is another project, uh, and it was really interesting to test the model in, in very different conditions. Um, and lake ice. the accumulation of snow and, and so on. This is uh, this was done by uh, this is a model done by Claude Buguet in the uh, University of Waterloo in Canada, who is a PI of this project. And we we coupled uh, Climo with a uh, with a SMRT to be able to predict time series of uh, of uh, wet forms and, and total backscatter. Um, and also uh, we were able to uh, to predict uh, the brightness temperature. Uh, because, as you know, uh, every uh, altimeter has a, has a radiometer, a microwave radiometer on board. So uh, it's quite interesting to, to be able to uh, simulate both uh, the waveform and the brightness temperature. Uh, you can see uh, the first result here. You have the simulation of TB uh, over the a time series of uh, four years. Um, and the pattern uh, obtained is very close to the measurement. So it's really nice. We have an increase during the, 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 the ice growth uh, of, of the brightness temperature. And uh, we have started to do the, the waveform simulation, but not, uh, not, it's not finished for the time series. But here you have an example of, of uh, waveforms for different um, snow depths on, on sea ice. And you can see that in some conditions, uh, we, we might be able to, to detect in KU band uh, the, the two horizons, um, the, the top of the ice and uh, the top of the snow and, uh, and the top of the ice. Um, an important remark is, of, of course, it's, uh, it's on the first res result, um, but something really good with the SMRT is because of the structure, as I said, and because we can switch between different options, uh, it allows a very consistent multi-sensor uh, simulation. I, I think it's a very important uh, um, asset for, for the future to develop smarter retrieval algorithm, whatever the, the, the domain uh, for passive, active, and altimetry. Uh, a few points uh, to conclude. Uh, so the, the, the result uh, I've presented and the model is, uh, is in the paper uh, today and uh, the publication, uh, uh, it was online uh, on, on last Sunday. Uh, so it's perfectly in time for uh, for this talk, for this presentation. Um, uh, I have also to say that during this uh, polar monitoring ISA project, um, we also used SMRT, uh, uh, but not with a brown model. We also did a coupling with a more advanced altimeter simulation simulator, which is called uh, Altidop, and it's developed at CLS in Toulouse. And uh, using this uh, simulator, we were able to, to take into account more complex configuration, like uh, a DEM, high resolution DEM, uh, to see the, the impact within the footprint of the, of the variation of the surface. And also, it was able to work in unfocused uh, SAR mode. And it was important, of course, to test uh, uh, different uh, crystal configurations. Um, and also, I already mentioned this, uh, this project in, uh, in, in the introduction. 
second, uh, we have started the validation on CIs uh, with the ESA across um, uh, project. But I, I really hope to see more studies on this complex and rich uh, environment. Um, for future works, um, there are plenty of different options. And uh, one option, uh, one work would be to implement uh, rich trackers directly in SMRT and to consolidate the study we have done on the elevation bias, but because um, I forget to say that it was relatively preliminary, it was not very detailed. And I think it's going, it's, it's going to be very important to investigate the, the performance of, uh, of the future sensors and, uh, and also to better understand uh, uh, the signal uh, of uh, existing ones. And the last uh, but not least, uh, it's very, it's the most important one is to implement new a uh, new mode uh, because currently we are lim limited to the LRM mode and I really would like to implement uh, SAR uh, fo and focused and focused SAR mode in, uh, in, with SMRT. And okay. that's going to be very important for Cryosat and Crystal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Gisela. I'm, I must admit that we are very late, run, uh, running that's very fine. late time. <laughs> we screwed up basically with a coffee break of everyone. Um, so I would suggest, so there is a, a, a thank you from uh, Stefan uh, Hendricks that you are putting your software up as an open source tool. I also um, I fully agree with that. It's very important to have models as open source tool. And um, there are uh, also comments of Paolo in the chat saying that he is, um, it's a fantastic tool and that he's looking forward to seeing the extensions to the SAR mode and the FF SAR maybe. And you really need to fit in an A for altimetry in the acronym now, making it SMART instead of SMRT. <laughs> okay. All right, now with that, we are coming to the end of the session and we would want to thank all the speakers again. And in particular, we would also want to um, to remind you that we will have a poster session in the very late afternoon and we hope to see you all again there being on board. Thank you all so much. Jeanette, this is a very good question. Um, I, I probably need to ask uh, the host of the next